My name is Leanne Lord, your new co-host for Point of Inquiry. My guest today is the one and only Mandisa Thomas. She is the co-founder and president of Black Nonbelievers. She is the host of Parenting Beyond Belief. In 2018, she was named Person of the Year by the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association. In 2019, the Secular Student Alliance presented her with its Backbone Award. In this interview, we talked about how in 11 years, Black Nonbelievers has grown and spread across the country and why it's an important safe space and not just for people of color. She shares what motivates and keeps her focused as a leader in the secular community and how she navigates the intersections of being an atheist woman of color and where the blind spots are for all of us. Hello, everybody. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am the new co-host for Point of Inquiry, the podcast that engages guests in conversations about the big questions in science, skepticism, religion, politics, law, and culture. My guest today is the one and only Mandisa Thomas. She is the co-founder and president of Black Nonbelievers. She is the host of Parenting Beyond Belief. In 2018, she was named the Person of the Year by the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association. And in 2019, the Secular Student Alliance presented her with its Backbone Award. I love that. And what listeners may not know is that Mandisa and I are both native New Yorkers. Dare I say, round the way girls. Yes. (laughs) So, Mandisa, welcome to Point of Inquiry. Thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Leanne. I know we have um, shared the same space over the years, and yes. uh, it's it's awesome to be interviewed by you for a point of inquiry. I feel it, it, it's not a party till you get there. Awesome. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, it's spe- specifically in terms of the goings on for folks of color, uh, in particular in the, in the atheist and, and secular space. But let's get started off and and, and let folks know about. Uh, your organization, Black Nonbelievers, you know, sort of how it started and 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 where you're going. Black Nonbelievers is a um, we're a nonprofit 501c3 organization that works to we build up community for black folks who are questioning religious belief in favor of leaving, as well as um, build up those the community for those uh, for black folks who are either identify as atheists or other uh, similar identified secular label who did not know that there were others out there because we (laughs) often get that a lot. Yes. Yes. That when you leave religion behind and due to, you know, the, the still overwhelming presence of the church in the black community, it can be difficult to find others who identify as a non-believer or secular. We find folks who question and challenge religion, religious beliefs, but uh, the A word is still considered very dirty. Yes. And also to find more of us out there is still almost equated to like finding a needle in a haystack. As an organization, uh, we sought to bring more of us out because we know that there are more of us out there, but it's a matter of having that bridge and that connection to show that, yes, there are more of us out here. And also that there is a need to build in person and online offline community as well as um, show that there is activism among the black atheist demographic. And, and, and that takes various forms, for example, because I think what you do as a comedian is still activism within our community. Thank you. We try to showcase the various forms of that through our organization. This is not just in Atlanta. You know, your organization has grown and I'm, I'm happy to say that you're even here in New York. Your rep here in New York. Yeah, Kevon. 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 Uh-huh. Kevon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know where he finds the time to hustle the way he does. He's always putting together social events, uh, which I think is very important because when we can come out and, and not just have heavy conversations, but just have fun to congregate together because we have something 
similar, you know, or, or we're coming from or escaping from, say, a religious background and to be able to congregate socially. Uh, but it's now. But again, not just Atlanta, not just New York City. Where have you guys where, where have you also expanded to? So, yes, um, of course, we were started. Our flagship is Atlanta, Georgia. That's where we're headquartered. Um, the second affiliate uh, was established in the Metro Orlando area uh, in oh. Florida. So we, and, but we also have uh, affiliate groups in Washington D.C., in Portland, Oregon, in Louisville. Uh, now, our, our most recent um, affiliate was established in the Columbus, Ohio area. We're also in Detroit. Uh, so we're about fifteen cities nationwide now. Uh, we're also in St. Louis as well. So um, there's, um, yeah, th- where uh, we have definitely expanded the organization in the almost 10 years that we we've been in existence. And, you know, that just basically is a testament to, for lack of a better word, the fact that <laughs> or maybe the perfect are, word. <laughs> right. Yeah. So there are more people who are seeking out that community. Right. Yes. And they also want to connect with people who not just look like them, but can also identify because as atheists and non-believers and, and people who are secular, um, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of similarities that we share with people from all backgrounds. Yes. But when you're coming specifically from uh, a more marginalized community, then there are then there are certain things that can re- that resonate with us, and that there are spaces needed for us to discuss the issues that surround the challenges we face coming from that particular uh, community. I'm so proud of you, and I'm proud of the the growth of the organization because I, I feel like when I came out, and you probably felt the same way, and I don't even feel it was coming out. I was just being myself to now find other people <laughs> that yes. felt this way. And even at first it didn't even matter the color. I was like, oh my God, you don't believe either? Hold my hand. What are we doing? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, there's a camaraderie. There's unity in that. Right. I had no idea. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to avail myself of that and then to have it be culturally specific as well. But I've heard you say um, several times that just because it's it's called Black Nonbelievers, you do not have to be black <laughs> in order to support no, the organization. Absolutely not. Right. No, you don't have to, you don't even have to be black to participate with us. Right. Because again, we are a 501c3 organization. Our or our um, events are open primarily to the public. Um, we do set guidelines though for those who are non-black or who are non-POC, is that this is not your space to center yourself. There are plenty of spaces for, you know, for the majority okay. of, of atheists who are represented, you know, and that's totally fine. But yes, um, we have been asked previously, you may have gotten this too, Leanne, about, you know, why is there, you know, lack of diversity? Where are all the people of color? Where are the black folks? Where are the women? Yet when we give these answers, there there are these, there are these institutional thoughts and practices within certain organizations that keep people of color from, you know, from consistently participating. Yes. This was also another focus of the organization was to, again, try to build those bridges and uh, form collaborations uh, and to show that, yes, um, if this is something that if diversity and inclusion and um, and wanting to um, hear from a variety of voices that include more people of color, then uh, it's important to to show to contribute and support to the organizations like Black Nonbelievers and others that are dedicated to doing this work. The atheist community is once again a microcosm of the wider writer culture. We need to be raise our voices and be seen. I kind of see you as as you sort of embody for me. You're you are literally being the change you want to see. Yes, that, uh, I appreciate that. You could have just done not uh, black non-believers and state just been in Atlanta, you know, and done your own thing. But you made sure to do that outreach. But even more than that, you are in uh, an integral part of the atheist community. There are other organizations that, that you are a member of. Can you, can you talk about that? I'm a member of both American Atheists and the American Humanist Association. Mm -hmm. I serve on both of those boards as well. I've previously served on the boards for Foundation Beyond Belief 
and the Secular Coalition for America. I have consulted with a number of secular organizations on different practices. So it isn't just about what it means to be a Black atheist. I've also um, consulted on how organizations and leaders can better improve their efforts for outreach and also on how to improve their diversity and inclusion efforts. And so, and and I like to say that I do that from a more practical standpoint because my, um, my career background is in hospitality. So I've engaged a lot of people during the course of my, um, my career and being able to manage people as well. There's a lot of intellectualism in our community. There's a lot of folks who pride themselves on how many books they've read <laughs> and how smart they are, which there's nothing wrong with that. No. But to be quite honest, the people skills are lacking. They are absolutely horrible because it's like you're talking at folks and not to them. And that has become a serious problem. Um, and, and even in looking into religious communities, even though the texts are completely horrible, they are a horrible reason to bond these communities together. They have certain social practices in place that are keeping, that are sustaining them. And there's nothing wrong with uh, and and it, they don't own that. They don't own this idea that you have to be religious in order to be good, that you have to be religious in order to be nice and to care about people. And I know this is something that has been a focus of the community in the past few years on improving, but it definitely needs to improve a whole lot more. Oh, we have stories. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. <laughs> and I and I have heard you speak on this, and you managed to do so both directly and eloquently. Because uh, unfortunately, and and I fall prey to this as well, because I like to think that I'm smart and I like to think that I'm well read. But if you are unable to, how shall I say, communicate that? If you're if you're unable to. Uh, have those practical skills that you talk about, um, then we're not going to advance uh, collectively. If I am paraphrasing you. Uh, yes, correctly. absolutely. I, I know that that one of the things, at least from on my end, as it's come up, you know, when I, I, I you've seen me, you know, MC at, at various conferences. And the question is always, you know, are we going to do a and a and everybody starts wringing their hands like, oh, that's not a good idea because it's mm -hmm. understood that someone will get up and and 10 minutes of their question will be their resume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like why they sort of have the background and educational fortitude to ask this question. And it's like, ain't nobody got no time for that. One thing I found, too, is that during the Q&A uh, portions, uh, some of the questions will be centered around something that is completely irrelevant oh, yes. to the conversation or to the, to the presentation. And it often centers a point of view that does not reflect the presenter. Right. And so it's always about, well, what about or have you considered this person? And it's, it's just like, oh, gosh, can we can we please not do that? You know, can it can it please not be that you're veering away from the subject at hand? Or even the person at hand, because that to me is an indicator that you weren't really listening. Weren't you really weren't listening. listening. Yeah, you were listening only to respond and to try to, you know, and try to get your point of view out there that you weren't really taking in the information. I want to say that is a delightful human failing across the mm -hmm. board. You know, yes. not just our community. I think our community is particularly susceptible to it because we're so freaking smart. Right. <laughs> Right. It's like we are too, we're too smart for the room. And so I think one of the things, again, as you said, that we can all work on and would improve the community are those core listening skills, like just truly active listening so that you can really have a good question when, when something honestly challenges you and not just as a, as an exhibition of your knowledge. You know, because I'm I, whenever I go to a conference, I'm assuming if you're in the room, it's because you want to be here. I think this this leads me to something I wanted to talk to you about, which is, I guess, the intersection of, of being black and female and atheist. And if you could just tell me how easy that's been for you. Who? <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, just a breeze, right? You just you Is make that a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely a trick question. Yeah, because it's it, not easy. I mean, first of all, being an atheist, not not none of these things on their own by themselves are easy. Right. You know, and we have the audacity to step into the world and be three. You might as well throw in left handed, <laughs> right, for the extra bonus challenge. But you seem to. And, and maybe this is me looking from the outside and being a bit of a fangirl of you. You seem to navigate this well. And I'm, I'm not saying it is effortless. I'm not saying that. Right. But you, you, you get behind the wheel and you're driving. So I think what has helped is my upbringing as a New Yorker. I think that has <laughs> helped yes. tremendously. Because... When you're from New York, and I'm from the hood in New York, right? Um, <laughs> there are certain there are certain characteristics and certain strengths that you have to develop, along with what I have learned as far as education and an experience in my experiences. But I will tell you what it has been like. It is it is to constantly be bombarded and to for people to either inadvertently or even overtly remind you that your experience somehow is to be diminished because you're either not a male or you're not white. And we get this from we get this from other people of color too. We get this from other black folks, you know, the ones who challenge the overall system and institutions of, you know, white supremacy and uh, the representation, but ultimately the underlying support still lies with them. And somehow that, you know, my existence as, you know, a black atheist woman who has become a leader and someone who has been more recognized in this community is to still be diminished and still not to receive the support that I know is needed. And that is almost a constant reminder in these spaces. I didn't get into this community to just boost myself up. Um, I didn't get in this community to be as recognized as I am now. I do appreciate that. I appreciate all of the recognition that has come with the work. Um, However, the, this work has been not been to just, um, you know, boost myself up. It is because there are folks who need us. There are folks who need um, to know that our organization exists. They need to know that there is a leader who will communicate and talk with them and not at them. And to know that they, there is support and care for um, that that comes from us and there's something that there there is something that we provide in a way that some other organizations don't and um, I'm, I'm, I'm unapologetic about that so having to keep that focus and our mission in mind has been difficult at times because there are some folks who will actually blatantly act like they can do this so much better than you or they, they can do they can do it so much better than me. And you know what? I say, hey, be my guest, because this this takes work and it takes a team effort uh, to, you know, to to continue to maintain these spaces that are, you know, these community building spaces. Um, but to constantly have that reminder or, you know, if we aren't being, um, you know, if we aren't being objectified in some way, if, you know, as, as women. You know, if, if we can't, if, you know, if, if we if we can't um, if we don't respond to that, then we're being ridiculed. Right. It's amazing how you can go from being a queen to a bee <laughs> in a matter of seconds, seconds. You know, simply because you don't do something in a way that someone wants you to. And so that has just been an ongoing that that has just been so ongoing so we we deal with a whole bunch of uh still societal stigmas that even though people have let go of religion and the god concept there's other baggage that people still bring with them and they still hold on to it and and when you try to tell them that this is a bad thing to do they will fight you (laughs) it's like they will they will fight you tooth and nail within the community we still bring our very human baggage and we haven't thought our way out of it. Is not what at all. you're saying? Uh, yeah, there are some things that people have not thought their way out of. They will again try to. They will fight it, and they will argue other people. They will project whatever flaws and insecurities they have onto other people. And like you said, that is a very human thing that people do. But where I hold our community accountable is. 
people, they'll put themselves on a higher level than believers because they don't believe in, they don't, you know, we don't believe in God anymore. Right. However, if you are still carrying those, um, if you are still carrying those, those characteristics with you that are harmful to others, when you let go of these concepts, you're supposed to be reconsidering everything that comes along with them. And sometimes that takes some reflection that takes some introspection. Overall, uh, we are supposed to be taking uh, information into consideration and reconsidering them. And if they're hurting other people, then you change it because that is su- that's supposed to be what we're about, especially if you identify as humanist as well as atheist. Yes, yes. Uh, and we haven't even touched on that, that there's atheists, humanists, free thinkers. And perhaps this is my bias, but when you identify that way, it, I think the responsibility for self-development and self-scrutiny is even higher. It is because it's up to us. You know, there is a lot that we, you know, I think most people who have subscribed to some form of religion, they've put their faith and trust into this entity out, outside of themselves so that there are people who may feel powerless. They may not, they may think that doing certain things and, and making certain changes is beyond their control, which it isn't. But you've been conditioned to think that way right. and to always look for either an, a divine answer or someone else to give you that answer. And you don't always need that. Um, there is a lot of empowerment that we can find within ourselves to where we don't need to be fostering this savior mentality anymore. Um, I, I always contend that it should be more about team efforts and team building because everyone has an important part to play. Right. But um, yes, there are, um, it, but it, but again, that is, that can be a very, very long road for some, mm-hmm. uh, some, for some of us, not as long, but for others, it can be very, it, it can be very time consuming. And it also can be very painful depending on your life's experiences and whether there was trauma involved. And it's okay to admit that. It's right. okay to admit that there was something you didn't know before and that you may have been wrong. That's <gasps> a start. Man, Tisa, know, right? <laughs> r- what, what are you saying? Clutch the pearls. <laughs> wrong? What? <laughs> well, it, it, yes. and see, that's, that's the other thing. Oh, Gosh, this is, I would so much rather be a Vulcan because being a human is exhausting. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, really it, it gets harder as you get older to mm-hmm. admit when you're wrong because you think you figured it out. Now, now, mind you, I'm in, in the midst of a full blown midlife crisis, so it's all wrong. I have been wrong about everything. <laughs> so I'm willing to, to sit back and question and learn. One has to be of that that mindset. We we did the most courageous thing ever. We We got rid of God. And yeah. and we're like, okay, that's it. Uh, no, <laughs> that is no, the no. beginning. Yes, it is only. It is just the beginning. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot to unpack here. Like from the very beginning, when you were talking about privilege, and I wanted to come back and, and mention uh, that there's a lot of unconscious bias here on all sides. You know, mm-hmm. you know people will will defer because they're used to deferring culturally. As opposed to going, no, I have as much expertise. People have really approached you or and let you know, either consciously or subconsciously or overtly or, or, or not, that they can do your job better than you? Oh, yes, absolutely. That even as an organization that is focused on community building, and yes, many of our events are socially based because that is an important piece to community building as well as movement building. Yes, um, yes there were fo- there have been folks who have um, basically scoffed at the mission of our organization. They tell us we're not doing enough and that, <laughs> yeah, we get a whole bunch of suggestions, but not much in execution. And people who, you know, there are people who always sit on the side, you know, they're called the armchair quarterbacks, the ones who sit back and say, well, you know, they think this stuff is easier because some of us make it look easy. Yes, yes, yes. From where I sit or maybe from where another person sits, um, what you do, some people may think is easy. And I I mean, as as a writer, as someone who writes and who presents it is not as easy as people think it is. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. You impress me as somebody who you don't just talk about it. You be about it. You know, yes. just to 
put a little urban phrasing in there. I don't think that's easy at all. And I, I've heard you speak about this. I, I want to say it was at American Atheist um, in 2017. And you were laying out some really, really great examples about how you sort of assiduously sort of guard the integrity of your organization, but, mm-hmm. and, and, but you, you expanded it. It's not just non, uh, non, non-believers. It, you, you made the case that this is what all organizations should be thinking about, you know, in terms of cultivating and vetting their membership and then making sure you don't have those folks who are just dictating and not uh, participating and how you set those expectations. I mean, I thought that was such a wonderful guideline. Uh, that other that you that you laid out for what you're doing, how and other organizations can do the same. Yes, and I appreciate that. And it doesn't mean that it's perfect. No, we don't we don't pride ourselves on being this 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 very holier than thou organization. I mean, like, no, absolutely not. But yes, it really is about making sure that you have people who volunteer because yes, we're still on a volunteer basis, that they share the same uh, goals and dedication or similar to that, um, that the organization does and that, um, that I do. Um, I don't expect people to do exactly as me, but yes, I hope that whatever leadership and guidance that I offer and provide is being taken into consideration seriously. And yes, it is a matter of managing. And it doesn't mean that we can't take on different focuses at times or different missions. And because if it's relevant to our movement, then we should definitely be discussing it at the very least. There should be, um, and and also how we discuss it. It, It's also about the how and and how we engage. Um, And and civilly is always, um, you know, the best way to go. It doesn't mean we have to agree but, you know, we, we can have different points of view and it doesn't have to turn or devolve into a fight. Wait, Mandy, so this sounds like crazy talk. Are you saying that as adults, we can actually agree to disagree? I don't know. <laughs> what I, are you I, saying? I, think I, I think I might be grasping at straws there. You've, you've been in the movement for a while. You, mm-hmm. You've seen people come and go uh, yes. and, and come in with enthusiasm and leave in exhaustion. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. I don't understand how you maintain. It's easy for people as they get more passionate about this to get mm-hmm. even more discouraged. What has helped you not pick up your toys and go home? And you, you kind of answered that a little bit because you actually have a goal. You have a, a bigger goal than just yourself. You know, it's not just personality, right. but community. But for you personally, what do you yes. do? Um, I, I will cuss. I will cry <laughs> when I have to, I will do all of the things that I need to, to, to be, you know, when I am, when I am very frustrated, I'm very honest with myself about it. I, I try not to hold anything back, but when you, when I have established because this is basically my baby, right? This is, mm-hmm. this is something that I'm growing and just like with children, you don't give up. You know, you have to you have to acknowledge that there are things that will go wrong. There are there are going to be people who will come against you. But in the course of developing the organization and constantly reevaluating myself, even though I tend to do I'm very, very hard on myself when it comes to um, how I do things, because even times I, there are times where I feel like I'm not doing enough. And <laughs> as if as women, we don't put that pressure on uh, ourselves already. Yes. Right. But um, what keeps me going is, again, the people who I have met, because there have been there are a lot of wonderful people in this community that I have come to know and and love. And that has been, you know, a result of me going to different organ, you know, different spaces and actually getting to know the people involved and the work that they do. And it's all very, very important at the end of the day. And knowing that I'm not the only one who is going through this, they have been able to be more comfortable in their expression and their non-belief, whether they fully identify as atheists. And, and the fact that we have connected so many people together. There are a number of people who have found longer lasting connections as a result of our organization existing and all, not just existing, but also being that, that, that go to for a number of people. And, um, 
that has been what, because there have been more good things that have come from this than the challenges. And, and, and for me to be challenged, it actually, it actually makes me a better person because I look to see what kind of obstacles I can overcome. And again, I think that goes back to the New Yorker in me mm. because sometimes we have to go into survival mode. And when you know what it's like to have to do so much with so little, you learn how to work it. You know, we've had to do that within our communities. We have to do that historically. Mm-hmm. And so some of us know what that's like. When, when, you, when, we, when we don't come from privilege, we, ha- we know how to work this. So there is a part of me that never gets so comfortable in feeling like, well, I made it to a point. So now I can just coast or everything is OK. There's always going to be something more that I have to do. And even though I do have to take time to, you know, kind of sit back and reprioritize myself, there's always the work that needs to be done. And if it's always going to be that, hey, if I say that this is something that needs to be done, then I'm going to have to be prepared to do it. Like you said, I don't just talk about it. I be about it. Right. I think that's valuable advice and, and inspiring uh, for any organization, this community, and life in general. I mean, they, I think these lessons are applicable. I don't want to let you go without asking you to talk a little bit about uh, your new conference coming up. This is to be the second year for Women of Color Beyond Belief, yes? Yes, it is. And it's a collaborative um, event between Black nonbelievers, Black skeptics, Los Angeles, and the Women's Leadership Project okay. uh, with Sakivu Hutchinson. And uh, myself, uh, Sakivu, and uh, Bria, Bridget Crutchfield, mm-hmm. are the three organizers for the conference. And last year, 2019, was the first one we did. And it's the only conference that has featured all speakers who are women of color, nice, who are either non-believers or non-religious in some way, or secular in some way, and um, if you if you weren't there for, and this is speaking to everyone, it was really it was in such an amazing experience to see not just the speakers, but also the number of women of color who were in attendance. Because at most, at most atheist, secular, non-religious conferences, um, the audience is decidedly different. Yes. Which they're, hey, people support what is important to them. You know, I, I give respect to that. Um, however, it is different. There is a different, um, vibe. It's a different experience when you have certain organizations organizing certain events. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it was a validating space, not just for women of color, but also everyone who was there because everyone felt like it was a safe space to not just learn because there was a lot of education involved. There was also a, a lot of information as well. There was also just a lot of camaraderie. There was a lot of love in the rooms. There was just there was just so much that it, there was so much in value that people got being in that space. It was worth doing again uh, for, for sure. And it's certainly worth repeating in the future because we haven't featured all of the women of color yet. I know we haven't had you there yet. There are so many women of color who are active in this movement, but yet people are still asking, well, where are they? <laughs> And that shouldn't even be a question. The same thing sh- happens in my industry. It's like, where are all the black female comics? I'm like, are y'all serious? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> They're everywhere. But I can only imagine when you talk about the vibe and the camaraderie. I mean, I know how I felt when I met just one other black atheist mm-hmm. or a black female atheist. I was like, oh, it was such a feeling. And then so I can only imagine how good this must have felt and how it combats the stereotype because you know you've written about this the the assumption and i guess by the numbers correctly so that all mm-hmm. black women are religious to to be in a space where uh that is so not the case <laughs> right is, absolutely is, it sounds like it can be life changing it is and even for the number of other black women and other women of color who didn't know that there were others in these spaces yes. and i could i consider myself very fortunate to have been to have engaged a number of people in this movement i know i said this before and quite a few of them are women of color 
who are very active and their work just is not as well recognized as it should be. And so why not have that space, that concentrated space that shows that even if other women of color didn't know about these other women, now you do. Now you do. You know, now you 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 have that space. Y'all can connect more with each other, which is what the goal has always been, not just for Black non-believers, but also for, for some of us who are still organizers in these spaces. Now, when is the conference and when is it and where is it? It's going to be in Chicago once again mm-hmm. at the Marriott Chicago Midway Hotel from the dates of September 25th through the 27th of this year. I, I'm assuming you do not just have to be a black woman to attend. Once again, this is about allyship and, yes. and building community uh, in the in the best possible way. But Mantisa, thank you. This flew by. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> and I don't know when I'm going to see you next. I'm, I'm thinking Dragon Con. If you're, yes, yes, I certainly am hoping Dragon yeah, Con. I am yes, too. we'll definitely be there. I am too. But I, I really want to thank you uh, for taking the time to to be a guest for Point of Inquiry because you are a popular guest. I, I did my research. I'm like, everybody is interviewed, Mantisa. Yeah. <laughs> like where y'all been y'all late you know? exactly <laughs> exactly but no thank you for for coming and speaking to the point of inquiry audience thank you very much I, and once again i appreciate you having me it is an honor to have you interview me leanne and and i really do appreciate it thank you mentisa thank you for listening point of inquiry is a production of the center for inquiry CFI is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit organization whose vision is a world in which evidence, science, and compassion, rather than superstition, pseudoscience, or prejudice, guide public policy. Do you care about science and skepticism? Then please do share this episode to help spread the word about POI and the topics we discussed today. You can visit us at pointofinquiry.org. There you can listen to all of the past POI episodes dating back to 2005. And support the show and TFI's nonprofit advocacy work by clicking on the support button on the site. Please also remember to subscribe. We're available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and your favorite podcast app of choice. While there, please be sure to leave us a review, as every review we receive means a ton. Thanks for listening, and talk to you again in two weeks.